Welcome to Dynasty Life. I'm Theo Greminger. Redraft ends, but Dynasty is life. And every single year around this time, I find myself podcasting with Matt Hicks. And it, a lot of you are now aware of John Lobb. Uh, you know, player profile audience has seen John on Futurecast several times. You just saw him on the game plan with Matty Kiwum. Uh, John's sort of been like all over the place, but John's partner in crime over the years has been Matt Hicks. And Matt is one of the people that, like, if I really need to know about a prospect and I want another person's opinion, I go to Matt. You're one of, like, my go-to guys. And I think that over the years, Matt has had so many hits, so many successful calls. You continue to do it year in, year out with your evaluation. And, uh, you know, people should be giving you big, big hat tips with that. I remember last year just talking about our enthusiasm with Jameer Gibbs how you had him historically ranked high. And a lot of people, everybody had him as RB2 in the class, and there was a lot of enthusiasm, but you really pushed it over the top. 250 PPR points later, you know, pe people see it. Uh, how are you doing? This is your busy time of year, Matt. You work all year long on this, and then it's like the, the, the two months, two and a half months of, like, craziness. Uh, this, is a, this is a very busy time of year for you. Yeah, quite an intro, man. I appreciate it. But you're absolutely right. It's such an exciting time of the year. You know, my process is really thorough. I've been watching probably everybody that we've talked about uh, that we'll talk about tonight. I was probably watching them last June, you know, and, and following them very closely through the collegiate season. Uh, so it feels good, man. It, it is a busy time of the year, but I, I love specifically having those conversations and chats with you. Uh, and, you know, what a what a grab with getting John when he hit the free agency market. So, you know, me and John are are thick into it here doing the rookie profiles. But but our discussions are always really great, Theo. So I, I'm happy to get into it. It usually involves strategy, some some real discussion and, and helping people, you know, really find that angle, that value point to get ahead of their league mates. Yeah. And I love how you and John will do so much work together, but you guys aren't like in lockstep on every single guy. Like I think a lot of times yeah. when you work with somebody, you know, whether it's redraft, whether it's best ball, whether it's rookies, you know, you tend to kind of after a while think the same. I mean, you probably spend more time speaking to John than you do your family members this time of year. So it's, <laughs> it's perfectly understandable, but you guys each take, you know, hard line approaches. Your guys are your guys. A few years back, the entire dynasty world loved Drake London. And then it was Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave was somewhere in that wide receiver three land. You uh, pounded the table for Chris Olave. You had him as your wide receiver one. Uh, you were that way for most of the process. There's been several other players that stand out for me where you flag plant a guy and you stick with your guns and you don't just kind of sway. But I have sort of a big picture question. This show is going to drop most likely on Friday, the day before we see the the wide receivers, running backs, and quarterbacks test. We get the tight ends Friday night, but it's largely a really fun year for us as for fantasy uh, fans because we can sit back and really enjoy Saturday and not worry about like spreading everything out throughout the week with the combine. But my question to somebody like you who does this year round is – is the combine a good thing? Do you think that this is something where it can kind of skew our opinions on players, skew the overall consensus, or do you view it as just part of the puzzle, but an important part? Yeah, I think there's there's definitely important takeaways out of the combine, but it is just a piece of the puzzle. Uh, and, you know, there's always opportunity uh, when there's large draft events or, or large news pieces or or just kind of consensus takes and opinions that get out there. Whenever that happens, there is opportunity for value, especially for somebody like me, who I'm I'm putting in a lot of work and emphasis behind these players, right? So the combine is just one piece in a very long process. Like I mentioned, it started last summer. I'm watching six to 10 games worth of tape on most of these guys, uh, putting that through a formula that I've built out in terms of a grading formula. That's that's like you mentioned earlier. It's really 
uh, led to some good hits like the Justin Jeffersons, the Chris Alaves, yes. the Puka Nakua's, right? Um, and then, you know, I'm adding into that my projected draft capital. I've got a good system for being able to anticipate what that draft capital is. And then I actually plug them into a projection sheet, too, to get an idea of year one value. So, like, a great example, I was so bullish on Jameer Gibbs because I could plug him into a projection sheet. It looked really nice, right? So, but all that to, to say is the combine where that factors in is it does a little bit of, of fact checking for me of, of sorts, right? So, you know, you can get an idea of how fast a player is on tape. Maybe I have a lower speed score on a guy. He goes out, he runs a 4-4, you know, one. I thought he would run a 4-4-9 or a 4-5. You know, I can bump that speed grade up a little bit because he's able to prove that. Maybe I don't see a lot of athleticism from a from a wide receiver because of the way he's schemed up in his offense. He goes, he he blows out the three cone trail. He does great in the in the high in the vertical uh, jump, right? So you can adjust in that way. But at the end of the day, Theo, the reason the combine is there, it's it's for the medicals. That's the number one reason, and that's what I want people to take away. You know, there's obviously great takeaways from the combine, but remember that the ultimate reason NFL teams are there. It's for medicals. It's to check, make sure these guys are going to actually be on their board, right? Somebody like Michael Penix Jr., if a team, you know, checks out his knee, uh, he's had two season-ending ACL injuries. If a team checks out his knee and goes, I don't know about this, they're not going to drop him around in their board. They're going to take him off their board, right? And so we won't know, you know, the results of the of the medical test, most likely, until draft night, and you see a guy start to fall and you have no idea why. Um, you know, uh, Trey Smith, he's not fantasy related, but Trey Smith is a great example of that. You know, the Chiefs have an all pro uh, guard in the sixth round because, you know, he got flagged on some medical testing. Um, and then on top of that, too, measurements. That's the other big thing for me. We're looking to verify some heights and some weights, right? Especially with wide receivers, it makes me nervous. College teams are notorious for overlisting their wide receivers. We did get some of these guys from the senior bowl. Like a guy like Xavier Leggett fell for me. Yeah. Supposed to be six three and a half. He comes in at six one. Uh, you know, with his play style, that's a big difference, right? Um, but then on the other side, you know, you're looking at JJ McCarthy. Is he going to weigh in over two hundred pounds? So, it, for me, it's really about the measurements and then just kind of checking some of my grades. Uh, but I'm not making huge grade adjustments in terms of the tape evaluations. Um, I'm not overhauling my process, but I do hope it leads to some. Uh, unreasonable hype and because uh, that creates value. So I'll, I'll happily soak that up if it pushes down some of the players I actually want in ADP. It's always an interesting thing because you study these players year, like for the entire season, you have all this tape on them. And then it's a few hours on one specific day. And that gets so amplified in the community. So I, I, I think it's a part of the puzzle. I love it. I'm a huge sucker for it. When I see a dude run a, su a super fast 40, I love it. I'm not, I, you know, but at the end of the day, it doesn't like replace, you know, what we see on film uh, and what like people are grinding out. Uh, but certainly it can, it can, uh, you know, amplify a guy. Like if Brock Bowers runs and Brock Bowers runs a four, four or two, uh, I think Ooh. that, the, you know, the freak out's going to, going to be there. I think he's, uh, I think he's, he's right there. But, you know, before we dive into this class, Every single guest on Dynasty Life, I, I ask a few evergreen questions. Uh, and we can eliminate Puka Nakua for this one. Uh, and oh, no, that was going to be my answer. <laughs> you get Well, okay, so we'll start out. You got to do it on the fly. I, I don't, you know, the Puka Nakua one, it's just everybody can answer that one, Matt. Let's let's go with the biggest disappointment. So, you know, you, you, you play a lot of Dynasty and you spend a lot of time with your rookie drafts and – when it comes down to it, you can't get everything right. Who was the guy you were bullish on, whether it was a veteran last season or a guy in the 2023 rookie class that was a big disappointment for you? Yeah, I got to tell you, you know, uh, well, well, this is good because then we'll spin it to the positive. But I, you know, you mentioned it like I stick to my guns. Um, I stick to my process. And sometimes that leads to some smash hits like we've like we've mentioned already. And sometimes that leads to, you know, overexposure that may or may not help in the long run. But I definitely was overexposed to uh, Jalen Hyatt this past year. You know, uh, seeing him in the Tennessee offense, I thought he was really able to separate consistently, work downfield. Uh, and then he got into the Giants offense. You know, the draft capital was lower than I expected. 
I, I, I still went in on him, you know, probably ended up with about 40 to 50% exposure. And he just wasn't consistently producing for the giants this year. Now you could look at that offense. You could look, you know, and say that there's a reasonable, uh, you know, possibility that he comes back in his second year with an improved quarterback situation, hopefully. And, and maybe there's another wide receiver that can open up some space and, and maybe Jalen Hyatt does put it together this year, but I mean, his dynasty value has has absolutely tanked from that rookie pick you would have used on him. So I'd say that's that's got to be probably, if we're thinking back to last year's class, my biggest disappointment. Yeah, and you had a lot of hits, Matt. Like, you know, you were a Dalton Kincaid. Uh, you know, you brought up Puka Nakua. You, I remember having a conversation with you about Puka Nakua, like early on in the process. You and John were both uh, positive about Puka Nakua as a guy to keep an eye on in this class. And obviously the senior bowl helped him out and everything, but uh, you get a hat tip for that one. But who was another guy who was a kind of a positive surprise for you, whether it was a rookie or a veteran last year in dynasty? Yeah. Well, you know what, this is a really good, you know, kind of tie in with the Jalen Hyatt piece. So I'm going to go Kyron Williams as my positive one, because if you want to talk overexposed, I was overexposed to Kyron Williams. I, I think, you know, if I went back and checked, I'd probably be around 70 to 80 percent uh, in terms of, of rosters that I drafted Kyron Williams on as a rookie. I was a big fan of his Notre Dame tape, but, but right to right. To and I'll, give you, about I'll, I'll interrupt you and give you a hat, another hat tip. You were very high on Kyron Williams. Like yeah. when we spoke this that this time a few years back in that class of 2022, you were very high on him. And obviously you had to adjust it after the after the draft capital with a fall and then the you know the very slow 40 time. But I believe you had him like RB3 for a while in the class. So yeah. another big yeah. hat tip, another hit for you, Matt. So sorry, continue. Yeah, your... it, it was only once he he performed poorly at the combine and then his subsequent draft. That was the only as that's when he dropped in my rankings. But if you look at just film grade. He was towards the top of that running back group, but it's a great, you know, I love actually, I didn't do it on purpose, but I love that we're talking about Kyron Williams because it is a little bit of a, you know, you always have to keep in mind what you see in Indianapolis. You can't throw it out, but remember just because somebody doesn't nail the combine, go back, check the tape, see if it makes sense. You know, if they run slow and their game depends on being fast, then yeah, you can write them off. But Kyron Williams, his game never depended on running fast, right? Um, so, so yeah, so, I mean, it was, I mean, you know, I would say at least two of my championships this year were in large part because I had that unexpected, you know, level of production in my lineups, especially at the running back position, you know, the way the dynasty landscape is right now. It's absolute cheat code. If you had Kyron Williams last year, and if you have him in dynasty, it's also an interesting litmus test on, do you cash out or do you hold for forever? But this is not a trade show. This is we're talking rookies, so we gotta keep we gotta keep moving. Here's another question that everyone gets asked, and I'll do this two prong. You could go you could go with a veteran, or you could go with a member of this 2024 class. If you could know the final stats of any single player in fantasy next year, who would it be? You know, this is the one I was really chewing on. I'm gonna say Justin Fields. I'm okay. I'm very curious about Justin Fields. You know, I was, he was my QB2 in that class. He was easily my QB2 in that class. Uh, he was very close to Trevor Lawrence for me. And I, there's enough of what I've seen from him with Chicago that I do still believe he can be a really successful NFL quarterback and a subsequent impact fantasy football player. So he is somebody who I've been buying low on. I do think, you know, it, it seems like it's not going to be Chicago, but I do think he's going to be a starting quarterback. The Atlanta odds have changed recently. You know, the, the, yeah, that one in, in terms of it would be, you know, it wouldn't be a, a good bet. It wouldn't be a profitable bet to make, you know, if you were, if you were betting on anything other than uh, to Atlanta. So uh, it seems like that's where the wins are going here. And it's probably the best case scenario in terms of, you know, I think Pittsburgh actually is pretty interesting too, but Pittsburgh or Atlanta, um, no competition in Atlanta. You have Drake London, you have Kyle Pitts, you have, uh, somebody else who I'm forgetting. Uh, Bijan Robinson. Bijan Robinson. Bijan Robinson. Yeah. So you have you have just a, a stacked amount of weapons, and, and quite frankly, the play calling it can't get any worse, right? Than in Chicago, he was not set up for success. So uh, that would probably be mine. Yeah. I love that one, and also he's an interesting one for dynasty startups because right now yes. you get a you get a real value uh, on Justin Fields' dynasty startup, uh, you know, price. 
and also a potential of the trade market because it's there's always a little bit of question marks about where he's going to be the quarterback of. As soon as we have a known landing spot with like a rational coach and a couple of decent skill position players, then uh, he'll gain value quickly. So that's a really, really fun answer. Before we dive into this 2024 class, we're going to take a break, but I'd first like you to answer one question. From a macro perspective, when you're looking at this class versus the previous two classes, and Matt, we've had some hits out of 2022 and 2023. Right now, there's more players being drafted in the top 60 picks on underdog in early best ball drafts from the 2023 class than any other class by a decent margin. And the second most are coming out of the 2022 class. So both of these classes have really sort of taken fantasy by storm. But a lot of people are on the 2024 class being the the class that they're most enthusiastic for. Where are you at with that? If you had to sort of pick your favorite class of the of this one and the previous two. Yeah, I mean, you know, I do rookie content. So my natural inclination is going to be the upcoming class always. Right. But, you know, if you look at this class. Uh, the wide receivers uh, are, are so impactful. And so when you mention uh, the the underdog, you know, ADP, I, I bet a big part of that is wide receiver. And I think what's really exciting and I think what folks are finally catching up on when it comes to, you know, uh, your, your best balls and your seasonals and your redrafts is that you don't have to wait for rookie wide receivers to produce anymore, right? Remember the rule used to be you always had to wait until year two or three. And I think we've seen over the last few years that it doesn't work like that anymore. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, at the top of this class, having Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors, you know, having, you know, if Malik Neighbors was, was the wide receiver one undisputed in this class, you know, even if you took Marvin Harrison Jr. out, you'd probably be looking at, you know, uh, an equal to or better than the last two classes in terms of wide receivers. And then you add in Marvin Harrison Jr., who I think is going to come in and be an immediate dynasty wide receiver one. I mean, you can make an argument that he's, you know, dynasty wide receiver six, seven, eight, you know, in that range before he even sees the field, um, you know, and then you're going to go Malik Neighbors, you're going to go Troy Franklin, you're going to go Brian Thomas, um, you know, Roma Dunze, there is an opportunity for six of these guys to get drafted in the first round. You know, 10 could go in the top 50 picks. You could have a dozen wide receivers in the top 50 picks, and that's really not being hyperbolic. So there's going to be a lot of draft capital. There's going to be a lot of excitement. But it's And then there's a ton of depth as well. Um, but, you're, but so you pair that wide receiver group out, which I would say easily better than the last two classes. Then you pair that out with a quarterback class that has four quarterbacks who are going to go in the first round. You know, three of them who are consensus, you know, top four rookie picks. Um, and, and so overall, it, it's hard to say that this 2024 class isn't significantly better overall than the last two. Um, but it's the running backs. You know, the running backs is where you're going to see an argument for the for the 2022 and 2023 classes. Rightfully so. I don't think there's going to be a, a more than one running back that I would take in the first round in this year's class. But there is going to be a lot of running backs that I like with my third and fourth round picks. Like there's some good depth in this running back class. It's not being talked about enough. So even once you get into it, you know, that third, fourth, fifth round, if you have a fifth round in your rookie drafts, um, it, there's talent, man. There's talent all the way down this year. It's exciting. We're going to dive into the running back class a little bit more. We're going to talk about some historical comps. Uh, and where does Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. rank for Matt in sort of the last few seasons? Uh, and we're going to dive into a few other topics right here on Dynasty Life after a quick break. Now, I know many of you are looking for a secret weapon for your Dynasty League, and I have it. It's called the Dynasty Dominator app. You go to the App Store, go to Google Play. It's right there. It's $5 to download, and then every year it's $5 to load the next incoming class of rookies, you can add super flex, add tight end premium. It's incredible because it allows you to look up players. It allows you to vote on whether a player is a buy, hold, or sell, and then see the market sentiment on that player. And you can compare their lifetime value rating from player profiler to their dynasty ADP at the FFPC, all in the price lookup tool. And beyond that, we have a trade analyzer. So you'll never lose another dynasty trade again. And in our settings, you can set this is a win now team. This is a rebuilding team. And then we let you compare players. Look at their metrics side by side. Prospect metrics, NFL metrics. It's all there. It's five bucks in the app store. There's some add-ons for Superflex and 
to buy the upcoming rookie class. Every year, you're going to spend $5 on this thing, and it's going to be well worth it. Welcome back to Dynasty Life. Theo Greminger with Matt Hicks. Uh, Matt, let's stick with this running back class. So we can agree that there's no Jameer Gibbs, there's no Bijan Robinson, uh, there's certainly no Brees Hall. But when it comes down to it, do you think that the narrative is sort of beating up this class a little bit? Um, I Because I see a lot of utility. I know you bring up the depth of the running back position. Like, we go back to 2022. That class, after we got after Ken Walker, there seemed to be a lot of guys similar, similarly in this boat where James Cook ends up with a nut landing spot. He ends up getting some decent uh, you know, draft capital in our rookie drafts. There was a Rashad White hive always. And then a few other of these guys, people were you know, somewhat liking. But last year, we ended up seeing like nine guys from that class finish as RB2s. This year, right now on underdog, we only see Jonathan Brooks inside of the top 36 running backs being drafted. Obviously, that's going to change after the combine, a couple of guys will sneak up. They always do. And after the NFL draft, but do you think that the consensus on this running back class is correct? That this is a year you want to pivot this is a year. You want to stay away. Uh, I'm not there. A couple of these guys I like, where are you at? Yeah. Is Jonathan Brooks really in the top 36 running backs and underdog? He's the only one that's like right wow. on that RB three line. I realize with the injuries, but at the end of the yeah, day, he's the one. Yeah. He's the one people are betting Folks, on a lot. He's coming off an ACL injury. What, just, uh, I'm, I'm in, well, I should say I'm in those drafts. I, I'm doing, uh, I think it's a great time to do best ball drafts. I'm a big fan of underdog. Uh, I guess you should keep drafting Jonathan Brooks because I'm, I'm not draft, drafting the guy coming off an ACL injury in the top 36. So uh create some value for me. But to answer your actual question, Theo, uh, the, the running back group, you know, one thing that, that I want I want folks to keep in mind. So the way that I do my rankings is, is obviously I rank all the players, but then I also break the players into into tiers. And my tiers are based off of the type of production that I, that I expect. Right. So, you know, my weekly starter tier uh, is guys who I think are in that running back two to three type range. You know, they're going to finish, you know, in a particular week, running back 13, running back 24, somewhere in that range. You know, I have three guys in this class that fit into that range. And then my next tier down are my what I call my flex fillers, right? So you're you're running back 25 to you know even 48. So guys that you might not be super excited about right now, but that when you need to fill up those flex spots on bye weeks, when you get to November and your roster is decimated like it is every single year. Who are the guys that are, you're going to be able to plug into those flex spots in your lineup and that are going to be able to either contribute consistently or have some really big weeks? And, and I have about a dozen guys right now that are in that flex filler tier. And obviously draft capital and landing spot, that'll shake up a little bit. But, you know, from, from running back four to, you know, about 14 for me, it's extremely close. And so there's a lot of guys who in the right landing spot and the right volume opportunity could be immediate contributors. And folks, the running back landscape is sparse. All right. We don't have the luxury to be able to just ignore the running back position through four rounds of a rookie draft. I understand if you don't want to prioritize it in the first round, but as you get into the second round, you in the third and fourth, you really got to find the guys that you're excited about because just there will be naturally guys who contribute from this class, um, despite the fact that it is like you said, Theo, just being berated at the top. Yeah, it's 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 funny. It's it's sort of like, and I don't think it's a hive mind because there's some smart people on avoiding this running back class. I just disagree. Like you said, I see utility here. There's a few running backs that I'm very excited about to see how they test. I'm into Braylon Allen. I know that's a polarizing one, but this is a guy that if he runs well this weekend at what we're guessing is going to be 240 plus, uh, you know, all the all the metrics are going to love him. All the uh, weight adjusted speed scores are, are going to love him. Who's a couple of running backs you have towards the top right now pre-combine, Matt? Yeah, I'll start by saying Braylon Allen is far and away easily for me. Locked and loaded running back one. I don't see it. I, I, I don't see the hate. I don't understand what there isn't to like about Braylon Allen. So you're looking at a guy, you mentioned it, man, 240, 
Uh, what is he coming in at? 6'2", 240. I think he's got excellent vision. He sees space on the field very well. He's a very shifty runner. He, he makes guys miss in tight space. He doesn't get enough credit for that. And this dude is physically dominant playing in the Big Ten. He runs over linebackers. You know, you'll see multiple times it takes three or four Big Ten defenders to drag him to the ground. Uh, he's got great contact balance after, you know, that, that first level of contact. Uh, and then you mentioned it, you know, if the biggest thing he gets knocked on is, is play speed, but he's 240 and, and you know, he's probably going to run in the high four fours, which is ridiculous. It's insane. Uh, and I'll say this, Matt, like anybody with questions about, uh, we're talking about a 19 year old who was on Bru uh, a Bruce Allen's freaks list for two yes. straight years. And if you yes. look at like, you know, and this is the whole thing, you know, you'll see these pictures of dudes working out. All these <laughs> NFL players are jacked, but Braylon Allen is comically jacked. Like you're yeah. talking about like a very low body fat percentage. This is not yes. a soft 240 pound guy. This is a, this is a dude. He's a converted. He yeah. was a linebacking prospect as well. He looks every bit a, you know, an outside linebacker in the NFL. If I told you he was testing for, for the linebackers at the combine and not the running backs, you'd say, okay, I, I, I see it. Um, I'm yeah, with you there. I'm glad you I'm, brought that up because there is not a wasted pound on that 240 for sure. Yeah, and then and, and you know you you mentioned it too. Oh, sorry, not to cut you off, Theo, but you mentioned it too. You know he's he's going to be 20 when he's drafted, or, or he'll be 20 when he takes his first NFL snap. He put up 1,200 yards playing in the Big 12 as a true freshman. He was 17 years old doing this in the Big. Or, I'm sorry, in the Big Ten. It's the second best, and you can make an argument for best defensive conference in the country. And that, that was as, as, a, as a true freshman at Wisconsin, as a three-star recruit. So he really got there and took over the job. Then the next season, true sophomore, another 1,200 rushing yards. It's it's absolutely ridiculous production. So he checks a ton of boxes. You know, I, I really don't see what it is for the, you know, the Fade Breeland Allen crowd. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of them out there. And how about the draft capital? Because I've had some people say, Theo, this guy's not getting drafted till day three. And obviously with running backs, we see certain guys shift around. There's no way I see it. I think at the end of the day, this is a guy that would not have left school at this age unless there was some sort of a uh, an educated promise uh, that he would most likely be a late second or third round pick. Are you there on his draft capital as well, Matt? Yeah, I lock it in. It's he's yeah. a day two pick. I mean, I there you go. I unless there, you know, is is some hidden medical that we don't know about, or there's some hidden character issues, not nothing of which we would have any reason to suggest there is. That's the only way he doesn't go on day two. And what I think folks need to recognize about draft capital is yeah, Braylon Allen might not go in the top 50 picks, but there's a very good chance that zero running backs go in the top 50 picks. And you know, Braylon Allen could go pick 60 and still be the first running back taken in the draft, you know? So, um, yeah, that's, I would be shocked. I would be shocked if he went day three. And then briefly, who's RB2 kind of nipping at the heels? Yeah, so the RB2 would be Blake Corum for me. I do like Blake Corum a ton. You know, I think he's physical. I love his vision, his, his ability to cut back. I think he's starting to look really explosive coming back from that knee injury. Uh, he's great in pass protection. He's great as a pass catcher. So I think he's a really high floor NFL player. I think a lot of teams are going to see him uh, as a guy who, who's a great contributor in a committee uh, for their team. Um, I just think there's a, a little bit, you know, I said uh, high floor. It's going to come with some low ceiling. So it's a pretty big tier drop off for me to go from Braylon Allen to Blake Corum. I'm with you. Those are actually my top two running backs right now. It's nice. uh, I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad to hear you on that one. Um, and then with, with Brooks, I'm fully prepared to move Brooks up, but I'm going to have cautious, I, I won't call it pessimism, but I think that a lot of people are simply just brushing off the, the injury because we've seen guys bounce back from this. Not everybody bounces back and you bring up the NFL where all it takes is like one weird physical and a guy with checkered injury past, you know, it can catch up to him. I'll also say Trey Benson is another guy that, you know, years back when he was an Oregon Duck, he had some lower body injuries that I think the NFL is going to want to check up on. Uh, so a couple of couple of running backs here uh, that we want to keep an eye on. Uh, now, before we dive into a couple of these other questions, I love when I talk to you and John, where you're able to tell me where this guy ranks for you, 
how many years back do you comfortably go now, Matt, where if you could rank a guy, you know, based on historical context? Yeah, so uh, the rookie big board rating um, goes back to 20, 2019, 2019, 2020, so four or five years now um, in, in terms of being able to, to score back. And then the other, you know, the other way that I, I really enjoy my part of the rankings process is that, you know, I use the same um, rookie big board rating or, or scoring grade uh, for my dynasty and my Devi players too. So I can actively, you know, look back five years as to, what that player value meant, you know, three years ago and, and who's comparable. But I also can look at, you know, the current dynasty landscape and say, you know, I think this player should be equal to this player in terms of, you know, their current dynasty value. So kind of kind of try to go both ways with that. And I love it because I remember last year, I don't mean to keep harping back on the Jameer Gibbs enthusiasm. And a lot of people are going to say, Theo, everybody loved Jameer Gibbs, but you can go back and check the tape. Like Matt specifically said, I believe you said Jameer Gibbs was like your number two all time graded running back yeah. right behind Bijan that resonated with me. And I specifically pushed you on Brees Hall as a prospect versus Jameer Gibbs, a prospect. And you went with Jameer Gibbs. Cause I know you were on hall the year before. So uh, I, and with regards to historical numbers, like everybody loves Marvin Harrison jr. And I'm with you. I think he's like wide receiver five wide receiver six in dynasty out the gate. And in terms of trade equity with him on your team, that's what you're going to get. In terms of dynasty startups, that's what he's going to cost. Single quarterback leagues, he's going to be the 101. But where does he rank for you when you start putting him into context with guys like Jamar Chase, with guys like CeeDee Lamb, uh, with guys like Justin Jefferson, where you've seen these guys as prospects? Where does Marvin Harrison rank? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you were on it there. You know, in terms of the historical numbers, uh, he has a very similar number to what I had for Jamar Chase and what I had for C.D. Lamb. And C.D. Lamb was my wide receiver one in that draft class. I know that was not a popular take over Jerry Judy, but it was definitely a profitable take. Um, oh, yeah. So that's where Marvin Harrison Jr. you know, uh, grades out at in a really similar place to those guys. Um, so obviously really good company to be in. And then amongst you know all of the prospects, there, there's only probably – um, she's probably like four or five guys that have scored out higher. Even, you know, my system is weighted for super flex. Um, so, so, so we're talking about, so that, yeah, you're yeah. adding context to that. You're talking about Matt is saying Marvin Harrison Jr. is like a top five and that's including the Trevor Lawrence's, uh, you know, yes. and you you name your favorite quarterback prospect over the years, Marvin Harrison Jr. If, if there was like an all time super flex draft for Matt, Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to the top five. So that's like, you know, yeah. that's about he's as good, good as it gets. He's, he's yeah, very he's good. good. I mean, you're you're we're talking about Trevor Lawrence. Um, you know, Trevor Lawrence was an eight eight in the rookie big board. You don't need to know what that means. Marvin Harrison Jr. was an eight six. So you know that's very close. Uh, Jamar Chase was an eight six. CD Lamb was an eight five. Um, so you know, these guys are really high at the top. Caleb right now is also an eight six. And so even if you look at my board, and and I wouldn't blame anybody for taking Marvin Harrison Jr. at 102 in a super flex this year. And I'm the quarterback guy. Like, I'm the draft quarterback guy. I wouldn't do it, but I also wouldn't blame you if you took Marvin Harrison Jr. at 101, even in a super flex. I mean, he's he's a fantastic prospect. There's, there's no such thing as a can't-miss prospect, but we're getting about as close as we can. I mean, this is like, you know, I think that's the one thing is in your rookie process for anybody listening – just forget about Marvin Harrison Jr. You don't need to like try to learn about him. Like that's it. If you have the 101 <laughs> and single, use it on him. If you have a high pick in Superflex, more likely than not, he's your 102. Uh, and if you're completely dead set at the quarterback position and you have like Anthony Richardson last year and two other guys, you can take Marvin Harrison at the 101. It's about your team structure. But what I do think becomes interesting is Malik Neighbors for single QB for a 102 is about as exciting as it gets. John Lobb, Jax Falcone, there's certain guys who have Malik Neighbors hysteria right now. I'm completely there, but I can't push him past Marvin Harrison Jr. And I do see a like a, a little bit of a gap there. Like if I'm trading down from 101 to 102 in single QB, I'd like to get something else on top. Malik Neighbors, I think, will be an absolute NFL star there, though. Um, so let's, let's do a little, uh, a, like r rapid fire. 
Uh, Malik Neighbors or any single 2023 wide receiver? Any say that again? Any single 2023 class, easy Malik Neighbors, correct? Not even. Oh, think yes, about yes, Malik Neighbors. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So then we go to 2022, where we actually had two in the first round and your guy, Chris Olave. Malik Neighbors or Garrett Wilson at this time in the process? So are you saying their current dynasty value now, or are you saying like where they were? The, yeah, like in your rookie big board uh, evaluations. Yeah, so uh, Chris Olave, I remember, was an 8-2. Uh, Garrett Wilson was an 8-1. Why is this burned into my brain? I'm not even checking my board right now. Uh, Malik Neighbors is an 8-3. So I would have Malik Neighbors slightly above both of those guys. And I just want to emphasize, I loved Chris Olave. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, no, 100%. Matt was the was Chris Olave fan club, 100% pounding the table for Chris Olave. We're going to have a big year from Chris Olave this year too, Matt. I think uh, that's going to Yeah, we're due. Yeah, yeah we're coming. due. It has, it's one of those yeah. guys where everybody knows he's good, but you want a little bit more in terms of actual fantasy production. But when it comes to neighbors, let's take it back a, another step. Okay, we've talked about 2022. We've talked about 2023. Let's go another LSU Tiger, Jamar Chase or Malik Neighbors. Where are we at? Yeah, it would, it would be Jamar Chase for okay. me there. Jamar Chase, I mentioned earlier, was an 8'6", so slightly above Malik Neighbors. Uh, but you know, it's not, a, it's not a bad spot to be lower than. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Definitely an interesting one. Now let's pivot over the tight end position. Uh, this is Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers is yeah. about as exciting as a tight end prospect as it gets. If you want to be like nitpicky on Brock Bowers, he doesn't have your traditional tight end alpha size. But at the end of the day, we just saw Sam Laporta at about the same height, maybe about five pounds heavier, finish as tight end one overall. This is kind of inconsequential. Um, where are we at with Brock Bowers in terms of historical level of prospect for you, Matt? Yeah, in terms of tight end, uh, he's the highest graded tight end that I've ever had. Um, pretty easily, too. I, I you know, we, you may remember back from that year, I was not a Kyle Pitts guy. Yep. So, yeah, Brock Bowers pretty easily clears uh, just about every, not just about every tight end that I've evaluated. You know, in terms of his um, athleticism, I think it's, it's unmatched in terms of his pass catching ability, but then also balancing that out with with a real physicality and real just physical dominance uh, playing in the SEC. There's really not much to be desired from his profile. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing people don't get around is you talk about like your your teammate score. Um, they Like Brock Bowers was dominant and featured when he's surrounded by NFL talent like mm -hmm. uh, James Cook. George Pickens, Lad McConkey, all these guys who are NFL draft picks, uh, Zamir White, and they're going to Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers had 13 touchdowns as a freshman in the SEC. If it was a wide receiver who had 13 touchdowns as a freshman in the SEC, we'd be freaking out about it. So the fact that it's a tight end <laughs> is absolutely wild. So Matt right. confirming this is the highest graded tight end prospect ever uh for matt i love that matt that's that gets me really really excited um yeah wanted to wanted to uh talk about the quarterbacks briefly um mm -hmm. you mentioned caleb williams caleb williams qb1 in this class you mentioned you have him as an eight six incredibly talented player historically strong uh numbers for you how about when we get to quarterback two in this class I know we're going to talk about J.J. McCarthy a little later on the show, but when we get to QB2, there's a little bit of an argument now with Jaden Daniels versus Drake May. And a year ago at this time, I think it would have been Drake May hands down, but it's been like a slow drip. Now you're starting to see mock drafts mocking Jaden Daniels going at the 102 to Washington. Uh, and I think in the, the fantasy community, there's a lot of Jaden Daniels enthusiasm and the Drake may people are starting to try to poke holes in his game. Is this a prospect fatigue thing with Drake may, or do you have some concerns? 
you know, a year ago, I was still getting ridiculed for my Jaden Daniels love. So we have definitely come far from uh, for, for Jaden Daniels. So uh, Daniels is still my quarterback three. Drake May is my quarterback two. It is very close. Eight four to an eight three. I mean, it, it's it's you know, it's it's one of those where you do you know you look at it and you're like, ah, should I flip those? But then if you flipped it, you look at it and say, ah, should I flip those? You know, so for me, you know, with Drake May, uh, I, I think that it's understated how much improvement he had in 2023, because I think if you're just looking at the box score, if you're just looking at the win loss record for North Carolina, you're not seeing improvement from Drake May because they had a, co- a, a change in coaching staff uh, that was less favorable to his play style in, in terms of offensive coordinator. But my big knock on, on uh, Drake May from 2022 was inconsistent mechanics. And those inconsistent mechanics led to, he would get in these super hot streaks where he would just be untouchable. But then when he lost that momentum, his mechanics would fall off and he would just get in these wicked cold streaks where he would throw into double coverage. He would, you know, throw interceptions. He would, he would make poor decisions. He would get stuck in the pocket, freeze up. You, you fast forward to 2023, his mechanics improved considerably, which is, you know, mechanics for me, number one thing I want to see from a quarterback prospect. And when you improve those mechanics through a coaching change, you're throw, you're showing you're coachable and that you can, you can have improvement over time, right? NFL teams love that. So now I see Drake May with really nice foundation, good footwork. He's got a clean release. He's got a smooth throwing motion. And it's led to a lot of consistency in his game. So you're right, Theo. I think a lot of people do have a prospect fatigue when it comes to Drake May. But I think those people haven't picked up on that improvement from 2022 to 2023. That being said, I understand Jaden Daniels as QB2. I may end up there myself. It won't be because I moved Drake May down. It would only be bumping, you know, Jaden Daniels up because you can't, you know, it's hard to put a price on the upside there that comes with Jaden Daniels. I mean, he is an explosive athlete. He's got a game-changing play style. And we were talking about Justin Fields earlier. Justin Fields has been performing as a quarterback one, despite the fact that he has absolutely struggled as an NFL starting quarterback, right? Uh, and so even if Jaden Daniels does struggle, he's probably still going to produce, you know, good fantasy football points as long as he's on the field. But I don't think he's going to struggle. He shows great pocket presence. He has great touch on his ball. He has great anticipation, good accuracy. He protects the ball, a ridiculously good touch on interception ratio. So there's a ton to like about Jaden Daniels. I won't sit here and argue with anybody that has him QB2. Is it too much? Of uh, of of putting expectations on a player, when I say Jaden Daniels could be Lamar Jackson part two. Yeah, you know it, it's interesting, and you know I certainly understand that in terms of that explosive running style. I do think that there's differences to their game. You know, I think Lamar Jackson has unrivaled athleticism. Jaden Daniels is an excellent athlete. He's more explosive of a runner. And not that Lamar is not, but I think of Lamar as a little bit more of just a pure athlete in terms of his running style. He's a little bit more elusive. Um, Lamar Jackson also is much, much better. And this is my biggest knock on Jaden Daniels. Lamar, uh, Lamar Jackson is much, much better at protecting his body and, and getting out of bounds, knowing when to slide. Uh, Jaden Daniels is, you know, I think he had a little bit of that hero, you know, quarterback uh, mentality that we get with college quarterbacks. But, like, the dude can take – like, he took some big hits. He got annihilated. Credit, he got annihilated yeah. often. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to his credit, he, he didn't miss – you know, the only time that he missed, you know, game time for an injury was when he uh, uh, had to leave the Alabama game early for a very questionable – uh, you know, a sack that was a direct, you know, helmet to helmet that wasn't called. But that's, you know, that's that's a tangent there. Um, and, and then the other thing I will say, too, is, you know, um, so I mentioned, you know, maybe not as much of a pure athlete as Lamar Jackson, but I think in terms of, um, you know, being a pass, you know, being ready as a, as a passer in the pocket for day one in the NFL, I do think Jaden Daniels is more ready in terms of his day one. And, and trust me, I'm not one of these people that says Lamar Jackson can't throw the ball. That's not what I'm trying to say. But Jaden Daniels is a very experienced and a very proficient passer, too. Um, you know, he hasn't just been in college for five years. He's been a starting quarterback for five years. Yeah. He was he was throwing touchdowns to Brandon Ayuk to show you how long he's <laughs> been in, in school. Uh, but, yeah, I'm all about Jaden Daniels. I think that's going to be an interesting one. 
And I think it really actually becomes a huge, uh, it's sort of a champagne problem for super flex managers where you're going to be able to draft Jaden Daniels, Malik neighbors, Drake may, it's going to be like a pocket where you're going to actually have to make some decisions. Um, but you know, we, we often talk about tiers and things change, Matt, but things don't really change. The, the truly elite are the truly elite. Certain guys will get propped up by dra- by landing spot. Certain guys get propped up by draft capital. But at the end of the day, we sort of know the tiers. They can, again, change a little bit. But if you're, let's say, a, a risk-averse dynasty manager, and you say, Matt, I don't care. I want to get into the right tier. Would you agree that right now it's a top seven in Superflex, or is it a top eight in Superflex, Matt, where you see a little bit of a gap after? And I'm sure there's micro tiers here. Like, obviously, the Caleb and Marvin Harrison Jr. tier is more strong than, like, the next tier. But at the end of the day, you're going super, super studs for, like, super studs. Yeah, so I think you have 101 to 104 as its own tier. And then I would say 105 to 108 will be a tier, will be a tier. So I think right now you're right, Theo, that in most rookie mocks that you look at, it's it's 105 to 107 is the tier. And the reason I say 108 is because I am convinced that J.J. McCarthy will be comfortably in that tier, you know, when he ends up with likely top 10 NFL draft capital. You know, we're just – it doesn't matter how much noise there is against him. He's just not going to go any lower than 107, 108, you know, in, in sneak, super flex leagues. Sneak preview for what's upcoming on the show. Matt Hicks talking about J.J. McCarthy. We're getting a little more out of you <laughs> on Mr. McCarthy there. How about for single QB leagues? And, Matt, are, am I a boomer for talking single QB so much? I'm getting, like, a lot of pushback because a lot of my content has been single QB dynasty league driven – and people are like, Theo went a little more super flex. How, what's your percentage right now in single versus super flex leagues for yourself? Oh, leagues? Oh, yeah. uh, 100, 100% super yeah, flex. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I need a little more super flex in my life. I And for the record, I play super flex, but I still enjoy a good single QB dynasty league. Whatever, everybody. Come at me. Uh, so for our single QB uh, listeners and viewers, would you agree that the cutoff is 104 where you see a gap between the fourth best player on the board and the fifth best player on the board, that's sort of where I'm at if I want to get in the truly elite, or are you a little more open-minded on expanding that? I mean, I get in a, in a single quarterback, I would probably say that it would be, you know, Harrison Jr., Neighbors, and, and Bowers. That's probably where I would cut it off, right? Okay. Or, or would you sneak Caleb in there? Is that what you're saying? I mean, I'm sort of a sneak sneak Roma Dunze in there um as a guy I want a lot of but but the, we'll talk a little bit more about a Dunze but so basically yeah. Matt Matt I'm I'm agreeing with you that, that I think that really right now the spot to trade into is the 108 in Superflex because I think that the perception is not reality and I think it, that pick is going to be worth more in potentially a couple of days so I've been trying to kick the the tires on getting into the 108 in Superflex Um, you know, I think if you can get a little higher than that, it gives you even more flexibility, but even though we don't love overpaying, I don't mind overpaying this year to kind of get in there. So I have access to guys that I think are really going to hit that being said, 109, 110, 111, these are extremely valuable picks with a class like this as well. But especially if I need a QB getting into that earlier tier really helps me. And if I need one of these somewhat elite wide receivers as well, I think that that tier helps me as well. But let's this is this is the show here. We're talking about Matt Hicks and and I are going to throw out a couple players that we view as must drafts, and we'll throw context into this. Not all these guys are going to be top of the board. We're not going to sit here and say draft Caleb Williams. There's a couple of high end guys we're going to talk about, but you also have some interesting players that maybe the the market hasn't really moved on as well uh, as as much as they should have. Matt, we'll start you out. Give us a guy that you want to have a ton of in your dynasty leagues. Yeah, I mean, well, let's start with uh, let's start with the guy we talked about before. It's JJ McCarthy. You know, I, I'm a big fan of JJ McCarthy. I mentioned mechanics are my number one priority. JJ mechanic or JJ McCarthy has the best mechanics uh, mechanical foundation of any quarterback in the class. He's got great footwork. He throws from a clean platform. 
Uh, he is um, he is mobile. He's athletic. Uh, he has good accuracy. And what I love about his mobility and his accuracy is that it doesn't drop off when he's on the run. He keeps his body closed, and he still has great accuracy. Uh, he has good processing and decision making. His his touchdown to interception ratio versus his collegiate career is fantastic. Uh, he has a better velocity than he's given credit for. And so J.J. McCarthy, I think, is is easily going to be a top 10 pick. But you're not going to have to pay that Drake May, uh, Jaden Daniels price. And when it comes to my formula, the way I break out draft capital, it doesn't matter if you're the first overall pick or you're the 10th overall pick. All top 10 of those picks get the same draft capital number for me. Because either way, whether you're you know going first overall or 10th overall, an NFL franchise is, is making a strong commitment that, that is going to translate to volume and opportunity for you. So uh, J.J. McCarthy, you know, we just talked about it, but if he's going 107, 108, it, it's going to be hard uh, to get a better value on, on drafting a quarterback, a starting quarterback in Superflex leagues. Yeah, I'm with you. And I think 108 will be in play when it's all said and done. Uh, you know, potentially, depending on what Atlanta does at quarterback, but I'll say that pocket that I really like for him is like 11, 12, Minnesota, where he could potentially sit behind, name your stopgap quarterback, you know, whoever they want to have as a stopgap. And then JJ takes over with Jordan Addison and Justin Jefferson, and then TJ Hawkinson when he gets healthy. That would be ideal to me. And I'll say I'm intrigued by Denver. I think that the mm -hmm. the shot the, Denver is interviewing every single quarterback. They're going to get one of these guys, but I'm intrigued yeah. by the Denver situation. I think that's a Sean Payton seems to really like him. There's a lot of less steam right there that would keep him up yeah. with pretty good draft capital. I'm with you. Uh, and I'll go for my first must draft guy. I got Sonic truth podcast. I'm arguing with Matt Kelly and Alan Soslowski this week. People are saying, you know, Theo, you're, 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 you're too much on the hype train, but we talked about him earlier. It's Brock Bowers. I want to have, yeah. I want to do whatever I can to have like 15 to 20% Brock Bowers on my dynasty teams. I don't want to not have Brock Bowers and I'm willing to overpay in a single QB league. I traded Travis Etienne for the 103. Like I'm making moves that are aggressive in order to give myself exposure to Brock Bowers. I think this is a special kind of tight end. This is a guy where right now, like guys like Trey McBride, some people might have a head. I think this is incorrect. I think Brock Bowers is tight end two in Dynasty without even knowing his landing spot. I think he's a fantastic player, and I'm willing to push the chips in. Pass it back yeah. to you, Matt. Pass it back to you. I like that. Three. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, Brock Bowers, I think you had it – you know, tight end two, three, four right now in dynasty. It, it sounds hyperbolic, but I, I, that's really where we have to start him off. I mean, you know, you look at what Sam Laporta was able to do. Uh, you know, it's it's just there's opportunity there to, to quickly turn yourself into the tight end one as a rookie even now. And I'll, uh, before you share your guy, I'll also say like, what if some team views him as Evan Engram on steroids? And we look at how yeah. successful Evan Engram was last year in Jacksonville and like yep. a in like a, a Jarvis Landry type target share. Like this is the kind of guy, like when we talk about tight ends, it's so difficult to get a high number of targets, period. You mm -hmm. can count on one hand, usually the guys that are highly targeted at the tight end spot. But Brock Bowers looks like a 140 target guy. And if I'm wrong by 15 targets, you're still talking about 125, 130 target player. So I'm, yeah. I'm, all, I'm all over him. I'm all over him, Matt. I'm all in. He's a unicorn. That's it's still a great spot to be in for sure. I'll go with my wide receiver three, uh, Troy Franklin out of Oregon. I am a huge Troy Franklin fan. I think I've been driving the bandwagon and it, it feels like folks are finally catching up. He's going to have a big week in Indianapolis. He'll probably uh, run in the four threes. My man is fast. He separates downfield with great speed, but he is more than just speed. He has excellent footwork as well. He consistently separates uh, you know, he's a little bit thinner of a frame, so he's six three one. He'll probably weigh in uh, about 180, you know, 182, 184, if I had to guess. Uh, but he knows how to use his body well. He, he puts it in good position. He understands angles, how to work the field. I see a lot of Devonta Smith in Troy Franklin. I'm not a big comps guy. I don't like to throw them out a lot. But the way he wins, the way he always has two or three steps of separation on the defender, it's very similar. The way he's able to uh, really win on slant and comeback routes, 
Uh, so I'm a big fan of Troy Franklin. You know, I think he's going to end up in kind of a sweet spot for fantasy purposes in terms of draft capital because I think he could go late day one. So he could go to one of those offenses that we really want to see a wide receiver to, like a Buffalo, uh, like a Kansas City, right? And at that point, woo, his yeah. draft value will skyrocket. Buffalo is where I did a, a, a dream landing spots, but but could actually happen one. Not like an insane person's dream landing spot <laughs> article. And that was where I said, I said Buffalo, where immediately he fills in and he sees more targets than Gabe Davis, Khalil Shakir type wide receiver two. He's yeah. the 110 target guy as a rookie. And then Stefan Diggs most likely moves on and it's wheels up for Troy Franklin. Such a good deep threat too. Like a lot of those spike yeah. week games that we saw out of Gabe Davis, like Troy Franklin yeah. could have weak winning potential. I love I love that Kansas City and Buffalo little spots. I'll say Cleveland. I think Cleveland's a sneaky spot for him uh, as well. A couple other teams That's like true. that in that, you know, and, and I'll say the Tampa Bay with the aging wide receivers, that wouldn't be the worst possible landing spot too in that back half of the first like round. Um, I'll keep this one going uh, and I'll take it to the running back position. And one player that I think you talked about the depth of the running back class, especially when we get to super flex, Talk about a guy that I anticipate being able to get in the late second round in Superflex. And depending on how he runs and where his draft capital is, uh, that that might be uh, appropriate. He could go up a little bit higher, but I don't think he'll ever steam up. And that's Bucky Irving. And Bucky mm-hmm. Irving led all college running backs in receptions last year. This is a guy where if you're looking at the odds for the 40-yard dash time, he's in there. He's like in the top 12 top 15 with most sports books. He's going to run very, very well. This is a guy where this is the modern NFL with these 190 pound running backs who get high value touches. You heard Matt talk about Kyron Williams. We talked about Jameer Gibbs, you know, James Cook. There's a bunch of these guys, Devon A. Chain, uh, Keaton Mitchell, in a little limited sample size. We saw a bunch of these guys have big impactful performances last year. Irving has the speed. He's got the receiving ability to be that like 15 touch per game guy and provide, you know, running back to plus value, uh, you know, for, for multiple seasons in his career, if it all lands well, I'm all in on Bucky Irving, especially when I know I won't have to really reach for him. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. I mean, you know, you mentioned James Cook, Rashad White, you know, not the same type of prospect, but he could have a, a similar type of role. Uh, in the NFL, which especially if you're playing a full point PPR, right? That that's huge upside there. Uh, I'll stick with the wide receiver here. I'll talk about Roman Wilson. So a little going going to go, you know, certainly lower in the draft than Troy Franklin, but Roman Wilson uh, definitely, you know, I shouldn't say definitely. He definitely could have uh, the fastest forty time for any wide receiver at the combine this week. Uh, he is a track star speed, uh, but I love his. Uh, physical handwork when he's working through his routes. I love his ability to stem off his deep field routes. Uh, Roman Wilson uh, is, you know, he goes up, you know, he's got a good vertical ability. And then, uh, you know, he's not a contested catch monster in the sense of, you know, being physically dominant, but I mentioned his aggressive hands. He always separates before the catch with his hands and he holds on through contact. He's fearless working over the middle of the field uh, in traffic Uh, So, you know, my fantasy comparison in terms of the type of value I think he could have and the role that I think he could play in an NFL offense, I see a lot of tank Dell in Roman Wilson, and I could easily see an NFL team deploying him in that way. So I don't think you're drafting a wide receiver one, but you're probably going to only have to use a mid to late second round rookie draft pick, and you could definitely be drafting a wide receiver two or three. So lots of upside there for Roman Wilson. Yeah, I, I love that comparison. I think he's also supposed to run. He's supposed to perform very well at pretty much any of the testing. Uh, this was a guy that dominated Michigan's strength and conditioning program. Uh, another guy that was on the freaks list. I've talked about him with John Lobb and Matty Kiwum recently on Futurecast about how, you know, obviously we saw last year the guys who really dominated the Senior Bowl, they all had really strong rookie seasons. And I think we could see that from Roman Wilson. And I agree with you, Matt. Even though if he lands at the end of the first round, early second round, 
he's the kind of guy that we get in the second round of our rookie drafts. And those are the kind of guys that end up paying off. Matt Hicks is oh, yeah. always a big proponent for, for trading for second round picks. And I am as well. And I'll stick with second another round guy. picks. We love them. We love second. Give us, yeah. a, give us your seconds. Give us your seconds. I will oh, even man. take your first if you want to give them. Um, <laughs> but you know, you bring up Roman Wilson. I'll bring up a guy that I think will have similar draft capital somewhere in that top 45 in the NFL draft. And that's Lad McConkey. And I think at the end of yeah. the day, Lad McConkey could sneak into the first round. But I look at that sweet spot at the beginning of the second round where you have Carolina, where you have New England, where you have Washington, where you have a number of these teams that I think it's going to be difficult for Lad McConkey and Roman Wilson, for that matter, to fall from that area in the draft. And I think McConkey, if he lands correctly, this is a guy who can just live in the slot and immediately have a contribution for an NFL team. Did very, very well at the Senior Bowl. This is a guy that a lot of these NFL scouts seem to project to go into the first round. Uh, so I'm I'm all in on Lad McConkey because much like Wilson, this is a guy that I'm not going to have to use my first round pick in my rookie draft on. And this is a guy that I think I could get multiple seasons of fantasy production out of. This is a guy that also we talk about getting on the field early on a big time program. Lad McConkey was on the field as a freshman at Georgia. This is not just like some guy who's, you know, an okay athlete that's just a great route runner. He's a great route runner, but he's a good enough athlete that Georgia was getting him manufactured rushing attempts and using him on special teams. And he excelled on both. This guy's just a beast. And I think Lad McConkey could be a very effective NFL player. Yeah. Yeah. McConkey's explosive. He has great hands. I think, you know, I really hope they just put him in the slot or, or let him, you know, really chill into a flanker role, like work the seam. I mean, he could, he could shred in the NFL. You know, the only, the only hesitation with McConkey is the injuries, you know, he's, he struggled to stay on the field. And I think that's the only reason that he's not being talked more consensus as a first round pick. Um, but you know, moving on here, we're digging a little bit deeper. Uh, but Cody Schrader, the running back out of Mizzou, is one of the uh, big red label my guys of this class. He's currently, as of today, you know, late February 2024, he's my running back three. I'm a big fan of Cody wow. Schrader. Say that uh, again, yeah. Matt. Matt Hicks, running back three in this class, is Cody Schrader. If you're going to walk away from Literally. one, take one player in your rookie drafts from listening to this podcast, just take Cody Schrader. Uh, because the last time I had somebody from the rookie big board have a guy in this sort of area in the draft highly up in his rankings was John Lobb telling me about Khalil Herbert and how Khalil <laughs> Herbert was going to help uh, dynasty managers. Nobody was drafting Khalil Herbert. Khalil Herbert gets drafted in the sixth round but ends up having like three weeks where you started him on every single fantasy team. And he could, and he did very well for like a short period of time as a rookie. So I'm, I'm going to be drafting more Cody Schrader. I don't really care, Matt, that what, what where he gets end, ends up because I'm not gonna have to use the high rookie pick. So continue your Cody Schrader love affair. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with Cody Schrader, a, a quick background on him here. He was a division two player. He, he just absolutely dominates at division two. Doesn't get a scholarship, but transfers to Mizzou as a preferred walk-on. And then within the month uh, of, of being at Mizzou, he wins the starting running back job, right? So he goes from a preferred walk-on to the starting running back. And then that was his junior year. He, he has great production, you know, really breaks out, has some great games. And then in his senior year in 2023, he leads the SEC in rushing. And folks who, who may not follow college football, it's close. Uh, Missouri's offensive line is not good. And it's not a good offensive line to be rushing behind. So to lead the SEC, the most physically dominant conference in the country, in rushing behind a suspect offensive line, it's an incredible feat. The way he did that, excellent vision. That's a thread for me, my running backs. I want to see players who see the field well. Schrader anticipates space very well. He sees space, he hits space. Being a decisive runner is a big plus for me, and he's absolutely decisive. He's he gets skinny between the gaps. You know, he'll he'll fit into a gap you think he has no business fitting into and just shoots out the other side. Explosive off the line of scrimmage, carries that speed well to the second level, and he's got good lower body strength as well. 
But here's the kicker. Here's the plus. Here's what really pushes him over the top for me. Cody Schrader used as a reliable check down option, used as a consistent target in the short field, used as a target in the midfield for Mizzou. Not only can he catch the ball, but he catches and turns up field very well, changes direction well. And so he has a little bit of yak potential to him as well. So I'm not suggesting that Cody Schrader is going to be B. John Robinson or Jameer Gibbs, right? But he is the type of guy where, you know, you can reasonably project out 175 on the ground, you know, 55 through the air. You know, that adds up pretty nicely for somebody who, if he did a rookie draft today, he probably wouldn't go in the first four rounds. Yeah. I do think his ADP will end up as a late third round, you know, 308 to 312 type ADP. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, going to have probably 75 plus percent exposure on him. So definitely somebody that I want to leave my drafts with. Well, there you go. Cody Schrader, uh, definitely an interesting one for Matt and one that you should be writing down in ink. And I'll do mine quickly so we can keep this moving. Adnai Mitchell. I'll go back to the wide receiver well. There's just not a whole lot of hype right now for Adonai Mitchell. Everybody sort of likes him, but there's not a whole lot of steam. I think when we get done with the process, I think he could also sneak into the back end of the first round, if not being drafted at the very beginning of the second round. You're talking about a guy who came to Texas, led Texas in touchdown catches in his first year there. This is a guy that had three straight years of catching a touchdown in the college football playoffs. He's a beast. This is an outside wide receiver that's going to help a number of NFL teams. I think he's a red zone uh, weapon in, in the in the NFL. And I think he's also got the body control and the route running ability that he can end up being a wide receiver too. Uh, so I'm in on Adnai Mitchell as another one of my must-draft players based on his cost. Matt, back to you. Yeah, last one here. It's a deeper one. Uh, I don't think he's getting talked about really much at all. I hope the combine changes that a little bit. Isaiah Davis out of FCS South Dakota State. I am a big fan of Davis. 6'0", 220. You know, when you're looking at an FCS player, you don't want to see somebody who is very good. You want to see somebody who is dominant. Isaiah Davis is physically dominant. I mean, he runs over these linebackers. When he's not running the ball, they used him as a lead blocker. He didn't get off the field. They used him as a lead blocker fullback when he wasn't getting the touches himself. And he, tell, I'll tell you what, he seeks out contact. I mean, he would just demolish guys to open up wings. When he's running the ball, he's shifty. He's got great cuts. He feels space well and he cuts through space well. He's got good burst off the line of scrimmage. He carries that very well into the second level of the field. Excellent contact balance. I mean, guys literally bounce off of him. I think he's a comparable pass catcher, um, and he's a really well-rounded guy. 6'0", 220, so he's got the size that you're looking for, and I think he's going to test fairly well for that size as well. So, again, another guy probably not going to show up in the first 48 picks of a rookie draft. If you're doing it in late February. I think he's going to be a fourth-round selection come May when you're doing your rookie drafts. And he's definitely somebody who I'm going to want, you know, at 406, 408. You're not going to have to use high draft capital, but he checks every single box that you're looking for in a day three sleeper running back. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I love that. Uh, Isaiah Davis, write that one down as well. And for me, I'll go with a running back who has a lot more pedigree, but a, a complete lack of buzz right now. And I think at the end of the day, the NFL teams are going to like him more than, than fantasy analysts right now, and that's Will Shipley. Will Shipley had 31 touchdowns in his three-year career at Clemson. This is a guy who was on the field early at Clemson. As a freshman, he was highly productive, and there was more enthusiasm for him then than there is now. I think what he does in the NFL is it translates with his pass-catching ability first and foremost. I think of a guy like Jerome Ford this past year, his kind of outlook. Like I think Will Shipley is going to get on the field early in his career as a pass catcher, and I think he could offer you a little bit more of like a handcuff plus plus a third down role. I think that he's going to end up having a little more enthusiasm when we draft in our rookie drafts in May than we do now heading into the to the combine. Matt, yeah. let let everybody know. Uh, let and I I told you it was going to be forty five fifty minutes. It's like an hour ten in. I got to get you out of here. Let everybody know where they can find the rookie big board. 
Yeah, man. If you enjoy this discussion, if, if you want to get in on the process year round, get ahead of your league mates, get in on some of those hits that we were talking about. It's over at patreon.com slash rookie big board. You know, every single NFL rookie who or prospect who's declared for the NFL draft is ranked in depth rankings. Like we've been talking about broken into tiers. Uh, everything is a really well thought out formula. It is not consensus. It's not just your average takes. Uh, so you get access to those rankings over at patreon.com slash rookie big board. But quite frankly, Theo, the best resource is get in on the rookie big board discord. Okay. Because that is 24 seven roster personalization, draft advice, uh, trade talk, roster overhauls. I mean, you know, this is the off season. This is the time where you can get an edge on your league mates. And so that's what I'm doing 24 seven. And then if you just want a little sample, check it out. Uh, you know, Rookie Big Board on your favorite podcast provider, Rookie Big Board on YouTube. Check out the rookie profiles that we're putting out. 15-minute, you know, videos, 15-minute episodes if you're listening. Uh, and it's everything you need to know about an individual player prospect. We've got 12 of those out, another four coming out this upcoming week. We'll get up to 40 total. Uh, so really making sure that, you know, whatever angle you take to get advantage of the Rookie Big Board, that you're going to, you know, get that value, get ahead of your league mates. And then have some fun doing it, man. That's why we're doing this at the end of the day, right? So it's a really fun spot to be. Love it. Highly recommend Matt's work. Stick with us here at Dynasty Life. I've got another, a number of, Really sharp guests lined up. I'm going to start hitting multiple shows a week as we get geared up towards uh, the actual NFL draft. Uh, everybody will talk to you soon. And uh, let's get ready. It's NFL draft combine weekend. This is like this is like a holiday for us. Enjoy it, everyone. Hey, I want to thank you for being part of this broadcast. If you have any thoughts on it, leave a comment. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more shows on the Player Profiler channel, subscribe to it. That's how we know you want more.